Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 264. Everyone I know who is having success in film right now is there because of persistence. Jay Duplass. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Soundstripe. Now, Soundstripe is a music licensing website that allows you to download unlimited music for your latest projects. And once you download it, it is yours for life. You can use the music for feature films, short films, YouTube, you name it. And they charge just a fraction of the cost of what a normal stock music library would be. You can sign up for a monthly or a yearly subscription. And if you want to get 10% off your yearly subscription, just enter the code IFH and go to soundstripe.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Streamlet.com. Streamlet is a unique streaming service that is dedicated to indie film and watching the latest indie film. So if you guys want to see what other filmmakers are doing with low budget, no budget, micro budget films, then Streamlet is for you. These are real indie films, not Hollywood indie films playing as independent films. And if you are a filmmaker who has a short or feature film that needs distribution and you want to get in front of an audience, Streamlit is also for you. You can also upload your films there as well. And exclusive to the IFH tribe, you get a coupon code HUSTLE2018 to get a monthly subscription for just $2.99. That's Streamlet.com. So, my indie film hustlers, today I have on the show Jamie Adams, who is the director of the new film, All Right Now, starring the lovely Colby Smulders, who we had on the show earlier in the week. And as promised, Jamie's on the show today to reveal all of his secrets on how, first of all, how he got Colby to be in his small budget improv based film being shot across the world over in England. And uh, I wanted to also talk to him about his process of how he casts, how he works with actors, uh, how he develops a scene, how he writes the um, the project, how he covers the project technically with cameras, what he's doing, one camera, two camera, what's his whole process like? Because I've had my experience, obviously, with my first two films, This Is Meg and On the Corner of Ego and Desire, shooting in a very similar style. And I know how I do it, but I wanted to hear how he does it. And he's been doing it longer than I have. He's done about four or five features, plus tons and tons of shorts. So, uh, And he really has embraced this improv style of filmmaking. And the one thing I also wanted to say, and I say it a little bit in the show, but you know, there is not one way to make a movie. You know, Hollywood and film schools teach you that this is the only way to make a movie. But if you look at the masters in painting, you throw a canvas paint, and a brush, and you give it to Van Gogh, Dolly, and Pollock, you're going to get very different styles, very different ways of doing the exact same thing, putting paint on canvas. And there is no reason why filmmaking can't be that way as well. So without any further ado, please enjoy my enlightening conversation with Jamie Adams. I'd like to welcome to the show Jamie Adams, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. No, no problem at all. Thanks for having me. You are, uh, we're, we're, you're in uh, London right at the moment, correct? No, I'm in a small coastal town called Porthcawl, uh, which is near Cardiff in Wales. Nice, nice. You see that I, I know nothing about what you just said because I'm, <laughs> I, I am, I'm here in Los Angeles. <laughs> I just right, know that explains, yeah, that exactly. explains everything. Yeah, exactly. Everything. It's, like, it's like if I tell you, yeah, I'm in Burbank, over over here by this corner in the valley. You're just like, I don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, but at least I know what Los Angeles is. You know what Los Angeles is. You don't even know my country. I know know barely enough. I am I am a typical (laughs) typical American. I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. It's it's expected. It's fine. (laughs) Wait, when I say Wales to people, they go, "Oh, that's." London, right? No, it's not, I know that much. I do know that it's oh not God. London. It's, it's Britain. It's next door to England. Yes, 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 of course. Um, anyway, so I wanted to get started. How did you get into the business, man? I'm not really in the business. <laughs> you I, just uh, make movies I, on the side? I, I essentially, <laughs> I essentially 
uh, just started, God, Jesus Christ. I'm 38 now, I guess. I went to film school when I was 18 Mm -hmm. um, in London, uh, Royal Holloway University of London, and met a fantastic filmmaker there called Gideon Koppel. Mm -hmm. Um, And Gideon made a really just fantastic award-winning documentary I think about 10 years ago now called Sleep Furiously, um, which as an aside, you should check out because it's absolutely just a beautiful, beautiful film. Mm -hmm. And he was just um, kind of looking at my short films and going, you know, looking at the way I was working with with crew and cast and whatever. And I was getting quite frustrated as an 18, 19 year old. Um, And uh, he said that perhaps you know, I was getting too attached to what I had going on in my head in terms of the way in which I would visualize what it is that I wanted. And I was getting frustrated with people because they weren't able to do what I wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. So he said, maybe you want to find a different approach to making your films. Um, And by at that point, I was, I'm from a very small town in South Wales. So I would just go to the video store and see like all the police academies and uh, and Back to the Future, all very sort of commercial comedy type stuff, really. Now you speak and... of you speak of video stores. What are those? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like iTunes. It's uh, like iTunes uh, and, and, but and you Netflix, to go right? Into it, and you see all of the covers around you. No, it's stop it! Stop it! You're making this up. You're making this up. I don't believe. I you. know it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> and you get to take it actually physically home with you and study. The... Anyway, it's ridiculous. And and, and you but... get feed and you get if you don't rewind, you get charged. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Britain. Not in Britain. They were just happy if you returned it in Britain. Nice. So it, Good to know. <laughs> it, it was. It was. I still got a couple. Like, anyway, we won't talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I just said to him, look, you know, this is what I this is what I'm into. And he's like, OK, well, maybe you need to be watching some other things. And so he he introduced me to uh, Mike Lee, the work of Mike Lee oh, yes. um, and Peter Greenaway, because mm-hmm. he Peter Green is from Newport, which is in Wales. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of just I stopped going to lectures, really, and just started watching, uh, wake up and start watching as many films as I possibly could play and catch up with the rest of the people that were on the course that already knew about all these great movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and the European cinema as well in terms of like French new wave and all that kind of stuff. And I started to appreciate that, that there's not, there's not that one way of making a film. Like whenever you see a, any kind of movie as a kid, like whether it's Jurassic park or back to the future, or, um, you know, pop fiction, whatever you always think, Oh, there's a way that you go about doing this. That is the same. Cause that's how you direct this a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I think I just kind of learned that that's not the truth of it. The truth of it, it can, it's very much an expression, an individual expression. And, and that's where the real great movies come from, whether they're commercially minded movies or whether they're, um, you know, artistic expressions. Sorry, bear with me. I just realized you are all now realizing I'm in my laundry room on <laughs> Skype on the podcast. Well, that is why it's, that's why it sounds so fantastic. <laughs> Let me go and turn that off. And I will be thanking my wife for leaving that on. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so as, as I was. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I went and looked at all this stuff. And, and that's when I started to appreciate that, really, it wasn't about trying to be like these other great filmmakers. It was about finding my own voice. And so that's where the improv started to come from. I started to realize I really loved working with actors, specifically spending a lot of time with actors talking about the stories that I wanted to tell and and making them more and more involved in the creation of these stories. And the one thing I discovered actually over the last couple of years is that I feel that Mike Lee's a bit disingenuous um, because he then goes away and he writes the script and then they right. follow the script. And that's all, that confused, that really, it confused me then and it confused me now when I've got actor friends who work on his, his films. It, it doesn't, if you're going to start with, a collaboration where everybody's really kind of invested in their character and invested in creating the story. It just felt like to me that you just carry that on Mm -hmm. um, into the, and I didn't know quite how to do that. And so, yeah, so as the years go on and on and I, I, I worked as an assistant editor, this is a really long winded answer. No, no, please. That's okay. Well, let me ask you, (laughs) let me ask you as far as, because I come from an editing background as well. um, How did it help you uh, transition from being an editor to being a director? Did it help you? How, how did how did that help? Yeah, it really helped. I mean, this is the thing: is I kept on making these short films, in trying to figure out how I was going to use this this sort of 
using the improv uh, method that I had learned from watching the Mike Lee films and from hearing from people like Dominic Savage over here. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, and, And I had time because I was able to be involved in seeing these incredible editors put together I mean, I worked on State of Play, which was a Kevin MacDonald movie, Mm -hmm. and Justine Wright. um, They were like an Oscar-winning documentary team who were making this film with, like, Russell Crowe. And who else was in that? I think Ben Affleck was in it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was was this huge film, and I'm in there in the edit, and I'm 23, 24. And it was just – I was able to be a part of these environments where I wasn't being bossed around on set because I did try – being a camera assistant for a bit and it was the most awful experience of my life <laughs> I realized the only time I ever want to be on set is if I'm the director yes that's um, generally the best place to be <laughs> as, yeah as a director I agree with you 100 I hated PA work I could not stand oh, doing PA work I mean you've really got to want to be like work your way up to be a cinematographer or something like oh. they, to do that kind of work I don't understand how they do it um <laughs> I didn't last very long and I ended up going into the cutting room and that's where I discovered that I could do a job as the assistant editor, which it really is a specific kind of, mm-hmm. you know, data orientated job really. And, um, and that suited me because then I could still be having these great conversations with directors and editors that I had no right to being able to be involved in, but because you're in the edit suite and it's much calmer there, mm-hmm. um, it's much, much calmer. <laughs> you, you get to, you get to have, you just get to have lovely conversations with incredible creative people that are making things that you want to go and make. Um, and the one thing they kept saying was just keep going, you know, just keep keep, keep um, writing and making the short films on the side. So that's what I did every year. I'd find the right people and and have the money to go and make these. I say have the money. I mean, they only ever cost about 50 quid or whatever. But mm-hmm. you go and shoot the movies on DV. And um, I think I just happened across something where I'm, uh, I started to go into teaching because my wife and I got married and very young, actually. Mm-hmm. And um about 25 and then we had our first child at 26 and I was like well that's it then I better make sure you know I'm a working class lad I don't have money in the bank my parents can't pay for me I need to Mm -hmm. need to have work a living out here so I became a teacher Mm -hmm. um lecturing in film studies and uh I was acting out a role really because I wasn't ever really fully invested I just wanted to be making the things that I was asking them to go and make um and so that was another jolt of uh, you're on the wrong path now. Like you're on the right path now. You haven't made I haven't I didn't make a short film for three years. Mm. My wife could see I was getting a bit depressed, and she just <laughs> she just went she just went okay enough. You have to go make a film. And when I say go make a film, I don't mean this European finding your soul kind of movie. <laughs> what did you the love? Se- the Seven Seal. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the thing is that, is that, you know, ultimately she was like, I'm happy for you to go be a filmmaker, but please, what did you love when you were when you were younger? Because that might lead you to a place where you might make some money out of this. Mm-hmm. And, she's um, very wise, by the way. Very wise. Well, she's still waiting, but, <laughs> but ultimately. <laughs> Mine too. You know, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, always waiting. But um, I, I, I was like, of course I love comedy and I love, you know, she's like, well, go do a comedy. And I was like, well. Okay, this is where the improv could work because I I think I think I know what's funny. Like I'm pretty confident in in what in a, in my knowledge of what is funny. But to actually sit down and write, I mean, I got and now I've got so many friends that actually you know they're great comedians and they sit down and they write, and I'm just in awe of them. I've mm. I've no idea how that you know they're able to. I know kind of stories I want to tell that might be funny or whatever, but to actually get the joke out of that, to mm-hmm. actually get the punchline out of that is um is a is an incredible skill and something i don't have so what i did have is i was like well i think i know what situations could be funny so i just started at that point then of okay forget this european cinema stuff but use the improv nature of working with actors and if you get the right cast and put them in the right situations then together you should be able to you know if jamie's laughing then hopefully that means it's going to be funny to other people um and so that's where the feature film, the first feature film I did came from, which must have been about five or six years ago now. I can't really remember. Mm-hmm. Um, 
It was should have been a short film. Like literally, the cast that got involved thought it was a short film. <laughs> That's always the best. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny though, because I remember Craig Roberts, who was, you know, he's from Wales, and at the time, he done the film Submarine. Mm-hmm. Did you see that? Film? The Richard yeah, Lewis yeah, Rogers. yeah. I, I, I've heard of it, but I've not seen it. Oh, he's so he was so good in it, and uh, and so he had he I had no right having him in my film, but he literally told his agent it's a short film we don't need to worry about this <laughs> <laughs> and like we were, were on set and we we're only shooting for five days this seemed to be the thing that i uh, thought that if i if i had twelve thousand pounds i could go make a film in five days and and we we would be able to give people at least quiche for lunch at least <laughs> like, at least <laughs> at least, at least that, you know maybe maybe, maybe, maybe um, some gas money coke. maybe maybe a coke as well yeah exactly it's a special but um and then, you know, I just got loads of really great enthusiastic graduates, mostly, to be in the crew, mm-hmm. uh, apart from my DOP, who I still work with now. And, um, yeah, we just started to amble along from, I made it like the worst choices. It was like, okay, so we've only got five days. So what I want to do is I'm going to start in London, <laughs> then I'm going to travel to Cardiff. Sure. Then I'm going to travel from Cardiff into North Wales, mm-hmm. and then back to Cardiff. And now they're <laughs> looking at me going you're just going to be on the road most of the time. You're not actually going to be shooting much. Right. right. And I was, no, no, no. Cause we're going to carry on filming whilst we drive. And they're like, well, that's against the law. Yeah. I'm like, well, no, it's this, that's what we're going to do. It's going to be fine. And literally the first time we set off in, um, in, uh, we were not in an RV. We couldn't afford an RV. Right. right? right. In Britain we have these really small motor homes. Mm-hmm. They're like, Think of the smallest caravan you can mm-hmm. ever think of. It's basically that on wheels. Right. And uh, and we got a couple of those, and, and we were just setting off. Just before we were just setting off, just literally the camera guy, uh, my, my DOP, Ryan, literally was just getting a shot of, of us pulling away, and he steps on a rusty nail. Oh! And then oh. a couple of the older heads in the, in the cast, uh, they were panicking. They were like, no, no, no. Well, now what happens is, is you go straight to hospital and you get a jab. Um, and Ryan was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I can just wipe the blood away. It's no problem. Oh, no. And, uh, and I was like, oh my God, I'm all about like guerrilla filmmaking, mate, but I don't want you to die. I don't want your foot to fall <laughs> off by the end of this film. <laughs> yeah. Like this is, I'm not sure this is a good idea, but he just carried, he just carried on. And, and then when, when I was like, yeah, we're just gonna, we're gonna shoot now guys. So don't get up and move around. Cause obviously it's a moving vehicle. But we're going to carry on shooting you whilst you know you're talking in the motorhome, and literally the 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 oldest cast member that was with us just as soon as we were about to turn over, he went, "No, stop! No, there's going to be no filming whilst we're driving." And oh, I was like, "Jesus!" I was like, "There goes the, there goes the film." <laughs> and this like, is your first and this is your first film in this style. It's the yeah, it was the first film in this style. It was the we literally had ten pages of scenes that I thought I needed to get mm-hmm. um to tell the story and already I was being told that like half of what I had which is essentially I, I find it hilarious like all journeys I think are funny mm-hmm. for various reasons and uh, due to like anxiety reasons probably for me and mm-hmm. and you know I always imagine the worst is going to happen that kind of thing and um, and so everyone's trying to keep everyone busy so I thought that was a fun thing to try and capture uh but but he wouldn't allow that to happen. It's funny. It's funny that I mean I've I've had this I've had some experience with that. But generally, everybody I get on board with my films, they are they're all on board. They're like we're all going on this crazy journey. I never had an actor stop me, but I have had conversations with people who just don't understand what we're doing. Let, yeah. and, and I'm assuming you have to have because it's just not the way you officially make a movie you know you need to do things a certain way according to the dogma of filmmaking um but when you like you know like my last film i shot at the sundance film festival like i literally ran around the, the festival and shot a whole movie uh, a narrative oh my God, that's, that's incredible that was actually one of the ideas i had a couple of years ago was but mine was south by southwest because that's why i've had experience though right i've had experience at sundance so i literally ran yeah. around about uh about um uh, three filmmakers trying to sell their film to a producer, and they're hunting down a producer at Sundance over 24 hours. And so cool. and I would I literally would talk to people, and they would just look at you with like deer head, deer light, like deer in headlights, just completely yeah. blank. What's your? I mean, I'm assuming that happens over there as well. <laughs> For a minute, I was imagining people with deer heads. 
<laughs> that's a whole Jesus. other. That's my third movie. That's a whole. That's, that's another like, movie. That's a, horror, that's a horror comedy. That's, that's a movie. horror film, but you have a comedy <laughs> with a musical twist. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's not get into conversation about pitching because then it just gets ridiculous. It gets gets, oh, no. Can you I can only imagine. It's amazing. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But no, but I'm assuming you have this kind of process. Even when you're pitching actors, um, I'm assuming you have this issue of like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, no. I mean – it, the, with the first film, it was interesting because all they had to go on my short films, and my short films were much more structured than the feature was going to be mm-hmm. because just naturally, obviously, you, you can spend two days on a five-minute short film. Um, you're going to be more structured with it. But with this first feature, I was trying to figure out how we get a feature film out of five days of shooting. Mm-hmm. And, and especially when one of the actors turns around and goes, no, you can't do that. <laughs> it becomes... Um, all right. It became it became an interesting sort of thing to deal with, to be honest. And I was one of the first lessons of not everybody, Jamie, is going to be as excited about this as you are. That's scary. That actually, that everybody, that people that get involved initially are like, "We're going to make a movie." That's the only. I think that's one of the primary things they have in their head mm-hmm. is, "We're going to make a movie. We're going to make a movie." And obviously, in Britain, and especially you know, in this case, most of the cast were from Wales. You don't really get a chance to make films full stop you know we hardly get any television programs made locally regionally so for them to get offered it they were like well this is this is amazing we're making a movie and then they get there and they and they they look around and they don't see anything that's familiar to them so they're not they can see the camera that's the one thing but the camera looks different it's <laughs> not the same camera that they're used to seeing right correct. Uh, correct and the sound guy is actually standing up and holding the boom as if it's a documentary which is confusing to them because they're used to seeing Sound recorders sat down at their mixing desk Mm -hmm. and they have their boom operator. So everything's very different. And the director's not saying, um, you know, this is your mark, walk to there, turn around, say a line, Mm -hmm. that's it. So it's, it's, it sounds exciting. But then I I realized in that first movie that, you know, actually for the, I think the key to making a film like this successful is to get the right cast. Mm -hmm. And so casting becomes very important because you're not just casting for great actors uh, that would be great for the role. You're actually casting for the the way in which you're going to go about making the film, um, and that's that. Yeah, so that was the key lesson from that first movie. Now we'll be right back to the show in just a minute, but we got to pay some bills. So I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. And now back to the show. Now, what is the process when you're developing a film? What is your like how does it start? How do you how do you move forward to the whole through the whole process? Um, I should have a really uh, strict <laughs> answer for this. But I think that the thing is it's very it's different with every story because mm-hmm. I mean that's the one thing I definitely don't want to do. I'm thirty eight now. I've been, you know, making films for a long time. Um and I don't want to start restricting myself. In fact what I what I do is, is I I let myself have more freedom every time. So mm-hmm. because it's about the story, it's about being true to the story. So for example, I'm just about to head into a movie now and I've been wanting to tell this story. It's a really personal story. It's one about my mum uh, passing away when I was 19 mm-hmm. and I haven't been able to deal with that uh, over the course of you know so now I'm ready now I've done the comedies I'm ready to to tackle this so I, I can see myself spending much more time prepping it like I'm I'm being much more kind of nurturing it being much more conscientious with it mm-hmm. and I think that's because it's a drama and because it's personal and I think with the comedies um 
and it depends which which one of the comedies it is. So, for example, with All Right Now, that was such a fun idea to come up with. You know, I spent a bit of time back in um, uh, a, a university environment, and I was like, these. St- I'm not really that old, but yet these students seem so alien to me mm-hmm. about how mm-hmm. how conscientious they are, how they're all about the schedule, they're all about are they getting enough out of their classes. I was like, I was only interested in where the party was going to be that night. And, you know, it's and they're not really they'll, they'll have a couple of beers, but then they know any more than that. And it's bad for you. I was just like, what? I don't understand what's going on. with you. Where's all the promotion about? We've got this party going on. We've got, you know, come and join us for this social right. evening. And it, I just didn't get and like they're not eating pizza. They're eating, you know, kale. kale a verse, and I, so, I just found it fascinating that it's, I, I didn't get it. And I, I was just like, my God, am I really that old? And then the idea of I've met a couple of my Britpop heroes um, over the last sort of couple of years. And they it's so funny meeting your heroes when they're um, not in their heyday, shall we say. Sure. And, and I was like, they're beautiful people. But like, why are they still doing this to themselves? They are literally they are literally uh, compelled to because it's their favorite thing to do. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, right, OK, this is this is the story. This is a fun story about a rock and a faded rock and roll star is told they have to stop and they don't want to. So they think they choose the next best thing, go to spend time at university and carry on the rock and roll lifestyle. And again, life is telling them that, you know, it's not 1990s anymore. Things have changed and mm-hmm. you've got older and you need to deal with that. Um, and thankfully I found the right cast. I mean, to it was a fantastic upon. cast. It was a fantastic Kobe. cast. Yeah. How that's, did- that's a different thing. I prepped for that in a different way. Cause it's such a fun thing. I let I let it be, very much um we had a we had the scriptment we had the 30 page uh, scene outline mm-hmm. but i was much more looking for broader comedy with it in places mm, yes. uh, than i would normally do as the uh, nut, as the nut shot shows <laughs> yeah well there we go yeah exactly there are there are a lot there are a couple of cliched moments in there that I thought which are just awesome fun, just fun to play around with and Whereas actually something like, you know, another film of mine that's, um came before that called Black Mountain Poets, that's yes. a little bit more serious because it's about sisters kind of figuring out how they're going to move on with their lives without being so connected. So it's a little bit more dramatic. And so, yeah, I was a little bit more kind of um, focused on what I definitely needed to do in each scene. Whereas with All Right Now, I really loved the idea that Kobe would come up with just such great uh, sort of moments and and looks and and ideas and I was just like you've got to follow that you've got to let that happen you well, know well, let, me, let me ask you a question how do you work with actors on the set what is the process of like shooting a scene so people who are completely foreign to the way that you're doing this how would you approach a scene with a group of actors um oh god again that changes uh, with each scene but I, I imagine on all right now because that's what we're talking about yes it's a case of um there's there's lots of different personalities going on as well uh within the cast and so it's it's i like to approach a scene in you know keeping the individual in mind so you look at who's leading the scene in a way and and to be honest in all right now it's always pretty much always joanne it's pretty much always kobe mm-hmm. so so me and kobe would just walk around the um the the set as it were the location and we would just have a brief discussion as much as she would need to i never lead it it's as much as she would need to talk about what she thinks i wanted this scene to be Mm -hmm. um and then i will you know agree or maybe bring up something else um that was on my mind about this scene when i was thinking about it and then she'd go okay okay and then she'd kind of have her own thoughts about how she thought it was going to play out, but we don't really talk about that too much. I always just kind of go, I want to see it. I want to, I want to, you know, let's play it out. That's why we've got this whole freedom to be able to do what I call the first pass, where anything's uh, allowed, where any, it's open. It's absolutely as long as you're listening to the other actors, as long as you're being considerate of um, everyone that's in the scene. Uh, and uh, then 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 it works really well to just let that first pass just happen. Um, all of us knowing, because I've had the individual chats with with all of the lead people within that scene mm-hmm. um, about what I feel it is for their character, perhaps whatever they need from me that they want to know. Um, 
and then we 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 play it out. And I love I love it before they go into a scene because invariably, if they haven't worked with me before, they'll go, "Oh, but um, I've got to talk about uh, I've got to talk about my dad in this scene. What do I know about my dad that's going to be important for this story in this in this scene?" We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And I'll be like, well, you'll show me. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> we'll play the scene. You'll know you've got to tell a story about your dad and you will start telling a story. And then if I feel it's not at all appropriate, then say, hold it there, roll it back. Give me another one. Right. And there's no time to overthink it. There's no, I never want there to be too much time for, because an actor has always been told to be prepared, always mm-hmm. learn your lines, mm-hmm. always know exactly what the scene is, where you're meant to be, where you're going to head. Okay, so I start here, I walk there, I turn around, whatever. I'm just like, I'm not interested in any of that phony, um, you know, theater. It's filmed theater, essentially, a lot mm-hmm. of movies. And that's fine. And I love movies, so that's not a problem. But for me, I feel like I want there to be a frisson. I want there to be an energy that you rarely see. It's um, true which some people call messy, but that's because they're relating it to film theatre. So in that case, it probably is messy because life is messy. Mm -hmm. Um, What I'm capturing is an element of, you know, life in its most real form in a way. And I hope whether they're comedies, whether they're dramas, whatever, that's essentially what we're setting up here because I'm not dictating too much of what's going on in front of the camera. I'm guiding. So once we... Once we see the first pass and we heard a couple of whatever it is, the beat of the moment, we've seen how that's played out. You know, we've, we've got the, the joke, whatever the, you know, normally there's like 10, you know, if it's a comedy, there's like lots of different uh, things flying about from different um, characters, different actors. And then in the, you know, in the next pass, we start to kind of mold it into mm-hmm. a more, what we would then consider to be more and more like a scene that we would see play out on other sets now where things are more you know structured now how many cameras do you use generally to cover your scenes well it was interesting i started off with two cameras and i found that that the b camera was always getting in the way mm-hmm. um and so it was just it, it, you feel like it's a time thing where you well, i've got to have two cameras because we need to move on quickly well it, i find this actually better with single camera um and i generally stood right next to the, my dop and during during passes, I'll be like, you know, got to go in close on Kobe right now, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that was meant to be our wide, but I see something that's happening and I'm like, well, that might not happen again. So I need to move in now. Right. And then, you know, and then I'll tell them to roll it back and then we'll move back out again. So I don't say cut necessarily though. I'll say roll it back and I'll tell them where we're going back to. Got and it. then we'll, and then we'll come back out and then, I'll, and then we'll, then we'll continue. Um, and you- go ahead. No, I'll leave it there. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I find it that when you're working with actors like that, with this, and generally as, as a as a filmmaker as well, when you do this kind of style of filmmaking, you're kind of out there without a net. Like you, you are you're exposed in a way that is terrifying, but yet exhilarating and wonderful because the freedom you feel as a filmmaker is something that I cannot explain with words. It is just, and I think actors. When they jump on that bandwagon, that freedom and that terror works so wonderfully. And if you can combine the two, uh, it works wonderfully. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I really want to see your films. I really want to see. If you <laughs> I, we'll be going down. We'll you. exchange information after the interview. No worries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I totally. I mean, I don't. I think I think one or two crew members who've been with me for a couple of films mm-hmm. feel that I revel in the chaos that I really <laughs> find a lot of it funny and so I'll be they think that I do things like I'll turn to the art department during a shot during a pass and it's so the camera's rolling and I'm like you've got to get me a trampoline right now <laughs> and they're like they're like Jamie <laughs> and they think that I'm that I'm, I think that's funny, but it's not, I don't think it, I, I mean, of course I can see it's funny when I look back, but at the time I'm deadly serious. At the mm-hmm. time I'm like, I've had a great idea, you know, they're in the house say, and I want to get them out of the house onto a trampoline, you know, and carrying on the same moment. And that would just be funny. 
Right. And that's really funny because they're trying to have a conversation on a trampoline because it's what happens in everyday life. I've got three kids, you know, mm-hmm. and you try and have a serious chat with them and all of a sudden they start doing something else. And it's just like, <laughs> it's you can't help but get involved in the comedy of it all. Yes, it's infuriating. <laughs> yeah, this is ridiculous. So anyway, so I think, um, I don't, I don't think it is, I don't think it's without a safety net. I think for me, it's the natural way of making films for me. That's excellent. Right. That's it. No, I mean, yeah, because if you look at it from the normal way of uh, or the dogmatic way of making films, it is working without a safety net. The safety net is the script. Uh, it is yeah. the full blown screenplay. And again, there are those places for those kind of films. Um, but uh, for me, I love it out there. It's just I, I love being out there on the edge. It just it's because you don't know what's going to happen next, which is something, you, you know, generally as a filmmaker, you kind of been taught that you need to know what happens next but that's where the excitement is and that's where the um the magic is so i always say I, yep. i'm there to capture the magic absolutely but, but they all know that i mean as they as in mm-hmm. every storyteller that kind of uh does any kind of um you know even even a guy down the bar telling a story mm-hmm. they know it's the bits that they start to go off track where they're making stuff up mm-hmm where, you know, they start off with a real story and then they're just like, okay, this isn't getting as much interest as I wanted, so I'm going to go off track a little bit. And then they're feeling a bit of the energy of what it is to be involved in an improvisation, mm-hmm. you know, where they're just like, find, they're going, what am I going to say next? What am I saying next? Whilst they're saying what they're saying. And if it lands, you know, then that's the best thing in the world, that they're, they're the hero, mm-hmm. that they've just created something out of nothing. And in fact, that's what any art is, is you are creating something out of nothing, whether that's a planned situation Mm -hmm. or not. I mean, look at the, I was talking to somebody the other day about where they were in, I wouldn't say which actor it was, but they were in The Mummy Mm -hmm. and obviously massive studio movie and whatever. And they were saying that, you know, Brendan Fraser wasn't too uh, chuffed with learning lines. Um, So it was a case of, (laughs) and this is, this (laughs) I don't know if this is true, by the way. Sure. So, Brendan sure. Fraser, please do not try and sue me. I was literally <laughs> talking about some kind of example of many situations in which blockbuster movies still have this magic. They still have this oh. element of people going um, down their own path. And I think, in fact, forget Brendan Fraser, that's Al Pacino, that's Bill Murray, that's uh, you know oh. Meryl Streep, that's any great actor will always... Uh, bring a lot of themselves and a lot of um, their thoughts and ideas and whatever else during moments. So of course they might be sticking to lines that they're meant to be sticking to, but they are, they're bringing something new and different and sometimes they won't stick to lines. They'll they'll do something else. And I think that's where the great moments come from. And it's kind of funny that when you look at, you know, top, uh, your your top sort of film moments over the years, they've been improv. Yeah. A lot of the times they're, they're improvised. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a better example too, or another example, uh, Iron Man. Oh I, yeah. Iron yeah. Man was a lot of that was improvised to the point where Jeff Bridges came out. Like we were making a hundred million dollar indie movie. Cause we would just show up on the set. It was me, Robert and John, the director, John yeah. Favreau, Robert, uh, Robert Downey Jr. And Jeff Bridges. We'd like sit around before we shot and like wrote out scenes and yeah. wrote out dialogue. And I'm like, I can't see at that point. It's one thing to do this on, on a small budget, but when you're at the hundred million dollar point, like yeah. you got to roll a little bit differently. <laughs> so it was fascinating no, to hear that story. No, I disagree. I don't. I don't. I don't. I mean, I hopefully I get to keep making bigger and bigger movies. Oh, just agreed. To more, agreed. Just to have more resources, mm-hmm. but I don't necessarily think that that will change. I love the fact that um, was it recently with Jeff Goldblum and. Um, Oh, God. Was it Thor? Oh, Thor. There was was a ton of that in Thor. You could see it. I mean, you've just got to be a confident director, confident in terms of, but that that has to mean it has to be right for you. So Mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're confident with, like, you know, uh, for example, Hitchcock was obviously very confident with with his um, storyboards. Fincher Fincher as well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's not one way of there's no one way of how this works. It's all very much an expression, and that's where the best movies come from. Is when you're able to be in your comfort zone and tell films with your own voice, and that's what I've been able to do so far. You know what's what's fascinating is, is I've never thought about it this way, but if you look at the the masters of um of painting, of just mm. of, of just of just painting, you know Jackson Pollock was Jackson Pollock, Van Gogh was Van Gogh, Monet was Monet. They all had their unique way of telling their story on canvas 
It was paint. Yeah, with the same same materials. Same exactly. exactly. Paint, canvas, and an idea. Yeah. And but they did it differently. And I think that's and I think what we've been taught so long for so long is that you have to make a movie the same way. You have to do A, B, C, and D to make a proper movie. When that's not the case with art. Same thing with music and, and so on. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It's the truth, but that, that's what takes me back when you say, where did it all begin and whatever else? It's like, that's where it, when you get into this business and whatever, which is an interesting term as well, which I'll always <laughs> struggle with. But it's just, it's, it is the truth of it. Yeah. But uh, it is that it is that lecturer, it is Gideon Koppel, the filmmaker lecturer who, who, you know, he was trying to just make me understand. I remember when he said the, ter- the, the words, you need to find your voice. I was like, yes. oh, you pretend- what, how pretentious are you? What are you talking about? <laughs> Like, I don't know. Right. No one told Tarantino to find his voice. You know, it's like right. we make films, and um, that's hilarious. And then I completely, as soon as I got into the, as soon as I got into my groove, into the way in which I like to make films, I was like, okay, I found my voice. Well done. <laughs> you were you were right. You were right, sir. <laughs> now I have to ask one uh, one question that uh, filmmakers listening will will die if I don't ask. How the hell did you get Kobe Smulders in your film? <laughs> <laughs> I've given away a lot of secrets. So you have, you have. Uh, I mean, you no. don't have to give exact details, but like, <laughs> and by the way, everyone, because we just said, we, you and I we were both saying Kobe, Kobe, Kobe Smulders is the, the star of all, all right now, um, who is in obviously some of the biggest movies of all time with the Avengers and Captain America yeah. and, and all those kind of yeah. films. I just want to know what the, where, at what point did you go, I'm going to pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and call Kobe's um, age. How did it? How did it work? How did you do it? It's funny, you know, because um, even before uh, all right now, um, there there been my. I did three other films before that, and in in the in the as I said in the first movie, Craig was in there, and people were like, how did you get him? In the second one, it was Laura Haddock who was in the Transformers movie recently, mm-hmm. like the last Transformer movie Laura Haddock was in, mm-hmm. and she was in Guardians of the Galaxy as well. Another small so, indie film, yes. So, so <laughs> yeah, so uh, Laura Haddock was in that, and they were like, how did you get her to come to Porthcawl and be in your film? And and then again in Black Mountain Poets, we had some great British, well, we had Alice Lowe, who I think you guys know now from Prevenge and Sightseers. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, so Alice Lowe is in that. And how do you, it's always the same question. And like the, the, the answer is, is I'm just really honest. I think you can probably tell from this mm-hmm. podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty honest and open as a person. I'm not trying to do a deal. I'm not trying to. You're not LA. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in a small town in Wales. I am literally like. Uh, I just love making films. This is how I make them. I would love you to come and join me to make this next one. And this is how, you know, how much fun I think it will be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, it, you've got to do your research. You've got to be able to, um, I remember Kobe saying to me, I think it was like the third day of the shoot. She's like, Oh, you're like, you're like some of my husband's friends where you literally spend all your time, like knowing what's going on in the film world. And I was like, I don't see it that way. (laughs) (laughs) I am always on IMDb. I am always kind of, I mean, that's, you need to be really uh, Mm -hmm. to kind of know, to appreciate what's going on out there and what opportunities exist. And, you know, it's not hard to discover if somebody like Kobe Smulders really wants to try new things. Uh, They're pretty open in interviews about stuff that they would like to do. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled across the fact that, you know, she was looking to to make something in England and and uh, and to do something completely different, and and that's what that's what the film offered. You know, the idea of making a feature film in a week, uh, improvised in a, in Cornwall, in a small area of England. It was just like, my God, this is insane. That you know, I have to do this. I'm not going to get offered this again, sort of thing. Right, and that's and that and that's. Uh, I've heard the same story from a lot of other directors when I asked them how they got some big stars. Is you offer them something that they're not being offered, something that they want to do, uh, something that excites yeah. them and challenges them, in, in a lot of ways, if they're looking for that. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's definitely not for everyone. And believe me, you know, I've approached many people that it's not for them. Um, but that's 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 a great honesty from their part. To be honest, is it's, it's, it would be it would be terrible. It wouldn't be great yeah. for anybody if 
somebody was like, oh, this is different. I'll go and do it, you know, without really uh, investing themselves in really thinking about what story we're telling, whether it's the right tone for them, whether it's all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I could tell from Kobe's independent movies uh, that she was always looking for uh, interesting characters to play and, and interesting ways of doing that. And I think for us, it was the fact of playing a such a uh, a character like Joanne. Normally, normally that's your Will Ferrells of the world, you know. Mm-hmm. Normally, that's like that's your leading comedy man. And uh, we just liked the idea that that it was, you know, Joanne was this kind of. Um, she had a similar she had similar issues to like somebody's like did how do you write did you write that for a, a woman in mind or whatever and i'm like i don't understand really what the actor brings that f- sort of femininity with them mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. actor brings that with them anyway so i'm not going to change how i write the character i mean men and women experience the same things <laughs> just in <laughs> slightly different ways and that's like, not yes. something that I need to write because I'm not writing a screenplay. I'm writing scenes. I'm writing, you know, situations. I'm mm-hmm. writing situations. And so it was It was a great exploration of, like, when we said she was going to get drunk at the bar and cause a scene, how does that work for a woman? And it was very similar to how it worked for a man. But, <laughs> in a slightly, you know, in a, she, but when she jumped on his back, it was like, okay, that's a, that's a new thing. That's a woman thing to do. You know, that's yes. a... So we discovered it together. It wasn't ever... It wasn't ever a, do this, you know, I'm never like that. I'm like, you know, look, this is what we're doing here and and we'll see where it goes. And and she was just, uh, just incredible in the way in which she threw herself into it quite literally. But, um, (laughs) that's awesome. Well, I mean, people just be honest, be passionate about your project and, uh, go to their agents. Don't be afraid of agents and, and managers and whatever. They're all, they're all trying to, you know, do the, do make the best work. That's all anyone really wants to do or, We'll do something that's different, you know. So right. Well, I mean, I love the film, and I and I will put links to the film and where people can get it on on our show notes. Uh, now, I have a few questions I ask all of my guests. Um, okay. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? <laughs> <laughs> Don't think of it as a business. Good, good answer. Start. Okay. Uh, that's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? I know these are, these are no, hit. I'm joking. Uh, that was uh, definitely Rebel Without a Crew. Oh, of course. Rodriguez. Yes. What an amazing. Which, uh, which I lent to a friend of mine at university and never got back, but I, I I remembered it. I remember many parts of it. It's it's a fa- that's that book you what you read it and you just I I saw I read it in college and I was just in yeah. awe in awe of it. Um, now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, to be grateful for where you are now and the opportunities that exist for you in that moment. Mm-hmm. To be in the I mean, na- to be in the now is basically you. Yeah, you could you you you're always trying to be in the future. Yeah. <laughs> you're always trying to be ahead of yourself. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to be this next year. I'm going to do this next year. I'm going to do that. It's like, well, just be thankful for where you are and what you're able to do right now. That's yeah. Be present because next year is not guaranteed for anybody. <laughs> no, not no, exactly. at all. <clears throat> now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? It changes daily, which is probably what everyone says. But um, right now, off the top of my head, it would be uh, Abu Dusuf, which mm-hmm. is Breathless by Goddard. No, um, yes. La N, which mm-hmm. is the Matthew Kasovitz film mm-hmm. with Vincent Cassell. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because of the humor, really, in that film. And just, oh my God, there's so many incredible exploration of filmmaking in in that movie as well vincent's amazing um and then when you choose oh my god uh this is too hard <laughs> probably <laughs> just oh god stardust memories oh that's a great movie oh, that's a great movie yeah well. no i i mean how can it's 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 so funny in places and so just obviously a great satire on on what it is to be a filmmaker but then also the 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 fact that it's a complete rip off of eight and a half and then <laughs> and, and doesn't really doesn't really care about that. And then also you have this moment with Charlotte Rampling and it's just like, what now? How <laughs> you just decided to just start jump cutting her face, uh, her expressions. And that was completely fine. And yeah, so it's um, it was also made during the year of my birth. So I think that's probably part of it as well. And is any is there anywhere online that people can follow you and follow your work? 
Um, I don't like people following me. I mean, we generally call that stalking in Britain. Yeah. <laughs> so I try, to, <laughs> I, try to, I try to stay away from that as much as possible. F- uh, fantastic then. <laughs> I mean, just just go find my films. You'll have fun with them. All right, Jamie, man, thank you so much for being so honest and can and candid with us, uh, and and dropping some knowledge bombs on the on the tribe today, man. I truly appreciate it. No worries, mate. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I want to thank Jamie for being on the show and sharing his process on how he makes films, and I hope it inspires you guys as well to just grab a camera and go out and tell your story. Don't be. Don't think that you have to do it the the way that everybody else does it. Don't think you have to do it the way that film schools tell you or that books tell you or anything like that. There is many different ways to skin that cat, and you just got to find the way that makes sense for you guys. Hitchcock, like like we said, Hitchcock has his way. Fincher has his way. Nolan has his way. Spielberg has his way, and uh, the Duplass brothers have their way, and so on. So there's not one single way to make movies, and tell stories. So find that one for you. And I hope Jamie inspired you guys to go out and find that way for yourself. And also don't forget to check out his latest movie, All Right Then, that will be available on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, and everywhere else uh, you can rent or buy your films digitally online. And it comes out September 9th, next Tuesday. I'll leave a link to that at the show notes at IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash 264. And that's the end of another episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for all the support. I truly appreciate it. I hope I have been of value and service to you guys today on your filmmaking and or screenwriting journey. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 